Howdy folks! Today we're going to be talking about smooth muscle contraction with specific emphasis on arteries. The first topic is the basics of smooth muscle contraction, and then we're going to talk about the different signaling molecules that affect smooth muscle contraction and relaxation, and finally we're going to tie in some pharmacology and talk about how different drugs can affect these pathways. Let's get to it. So here I've drawn a smooth muscle cell. Now similar to cardiac and skeletal muscle, muscle contraction is all about actin and myosin binding together and interacting. So that's, that's similar with smooth muscle. What's different, however, is that there's no more troponin and tropomyosin, none of that, right? And smooth muscle is all about myosin light chain kinase and phosphatase. So here I've drawn a myosin light chain molecule. I'll be calling it just myosin. And as you can see here, this is in the relaxed state. Now, when myosin light chain kinase, or MLCK, phosphorylates myosin, it becomes well, phosphorylated. And that's going to cause the muscle to contract. Therefore, we can say that MLCK promotes uh, muscle contraction, smooth muscle contraction, and in the context of blood vessels, vasoconstriction. That's really important. Smooth muscle contraction in arteries is going to cause vasoconstriction. Now, here we have myosin light chain phosphatase, or MLCP, that's going to undo the work of MLCK and turn it back to the unphosphorylated state, which is relaxed. Therefore, MLCP will therefore promote uh, smooth muscle relaxation or vasodilation. So smooth muscle relaxation and vasodilation are intimately related. That's the basics of how it works. Now, there are a lot of factors that affect the dynamic between the unphosphorylated, relaxed, or the phosphorylated and contracted states. And we're going to be talking a bit about those factors. So on the side of the cell, I've drawn a bunch of receptors and a bunch of signaling molecules that affect uh, myosin, light chain kinase, and myosin, light chain phosphatase. So we have endothelin 1, epinephrine and norepinephrine, prostacyclins, these guys again, we'll get to that later, and nitric oxide. So let's start with endothelin at the top. Endothelin 1 is a molecule that is produced by endothelial cells of these arteries, and it's sent in a perican fashion to these smooth muscle cells to tell them, hey, please contract. These will bind to their ETA receptor, which is the GQGPCR. Now, GQGPCR is will activate the enzyme phospholipase C, or PLC, and that's going to convert the molecule PIP2 into DAG and IP3 that we have right over here. Now, the DAG is not too important for this pathway. But the IP3 is then going to travel to the cycloplasmic reticulum, and that's just a fancy word for endoplasmic reticulum in muscle cells. And it's going to cause these to release uh, calcium ions into the cytosol. Once these calcium ions are in the cytosol, they're going to bind to calmodulin, creating a calcium calmodulin complex. This complex is then going to activate MLCK, which is then going to phosphorylate myosin and promote muscle uh, contraction. Therefore, we can see that endothelin promotes smooth muscle contraction in arteries and therefore is a vasoconstrictor. So endothelin 1, smooth muscle contraction, vasoconstrictor. Perfect. Now let's talk a little bit about epinephrine and norepinephrine. So these, so these two molecules can bind to different receptors, but when they bind to the alpha-1 receptor, they're also going to promote smooth muscle contraction. By the way, I don't think I mentioned this yet. All the reds are uh, vasoconstrictors and all the blues are vasodilators. So when you go back to review this, red is constricting. Uh, blues relaxing. Anyways, back to the program. So, epinephrine and norepinephrine can bind to the GQ alpha-1 receptors, and through the same mechanism, uh, through PLC, it'll create some IP3, that'll go to the endoplasmic reticulum, release calcium, binds to calmodulin, activates MLTK, and boom, you have muscle contraction due to phosphorylated myosin. So these two have the same mechanism, more downstream, but they start with dis distinct receptors. So those are the two vasoconstrictors through smooth muscle uh, contraction. Here we have three uh, vasodilating pathways. So prostacyclins uh, are released by endothelial cells, and they're going to travel to the smooth muscle cell, and they're going to bind to the GS receptor. Now GS receptors will activate adenylocyclase, and that will convert uh, ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP will then work to inhibit MLCK. So that's going to promote myosin in the unphosphorylated and relaxed state. Therefore, CAMP reduces uh, phosphorylation and reduces contraction. Therefore, we can say that it's a vasodilator. And prostacyclins, smooth muscle relaxation, vasodilation. Here we have epinephrine and norepinephrine again. If they choose to bind to the beta 2 receptor, they can actually induce the same pathway and also lead to the inactivation of MLCK and promote smooth muscle relaxation and therefore vasodilation as well. So these two promote, promote the, essentially the same pathway, but they bind to different receptors on the cell. And finally, we have nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is also uh, produced by endothelial cells. Since this is not a large molecule, it can just diffuse straight into the membrane. 
it's going to bind to soluble guanylocyclase in the cytosol. And this is going to convert GTP into cyclic GMP. Now cyclic GMP is then going to bind or activate MLCP. It's going to promote uh, dephosphorylation and therefore relaxation. So nitric oxide is also a vasodilator. And just one note to add, I mentioned how endothelin 1, prostacyclins, and nitric oxide are all released by endothelial cells, whereas epinephrine and norepinephrine are not. They can be released in the neurotransmitter format, into the blood through the adrenal glands, at different means, but they're not a paracrine, they're not from endothelial cells, whereas these three are um, from endothelial cells of the blood vessels. And one last note, uh, the reason that these can actually have antagonistic effects is that these receptors are often found in different places. So in um, blood vessels that supply skeletal and cardiac muscle, you might find more beta-2 receptors, whereas in blood vessels in, in the GI tract might be more alpha-1, and this relates to the whole sympathetic response and which things you want to vasoconstrict and vasodilate. So you don't necessarily find all these five receptors on every smooth muscle cell. I'm just saying that these are factors you, you should consider in smooth muscle physiology. So before we discuss pharmacology, I want to add a quick little point I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, in this part of the cell, we have the channel that's letting calcium in. These are called L-type calcium channels. Now, there's a variety of stimuli that might open and close these, but I just wanted to mention that they exist also, and they let in calcium, therefore allowing calcium to bind to calmodula and promote muscle contraction and vasoconstriction. So now we're going to talk about pharmacology. So now that I left off with L-type calcium channels, let's talk about calcium channel blockers. And since calcium channels, when they're open, normally allow calcium to go in to have a net effect of vasoconstriction through smooth muscle uh, contraction, calcium channel blockers will prevent that, right? So if you prevent vasoconstriction, you're promoting vasodilation. And that's generally going to increase your blood pressure by decreasing your total peripheral resistance. Because as you recall, resistance uh, is inversely proportional to the radius of the vessel. So if you shrink the radius of the vessel, your blood pressure is going to go up. Uh, but if you uh, increase the radius of the vessel, like you do in vasodilation, with a calcium channel blocker, you're going to increase the radius and you're going to drop the resistance, so you're going to drop the blood pressure. Therefore, you can use calcium channel blockers to decrease blood pressure. Now, there are some calcium channel blockers that focus more on smooth muscle, some that focus more on the heart. Um, it, there is definitely variance, but I just wanted to bring up the fact that calcium channel blockers can be used in the context of smooth muscle contraction for blood pressure control. So here we have bosentin. Bosentin is an endothelin A receptor antagonist. So this is going to competitively uh, bind to the receptor and kick endothelin 1 out, therefore preventing this from inducing its action. So by preventing endothelin 1 from promoting vasoconstriction, this is going to promote vasodilation. So mesentin promotes vasodilation, and it's used therapeutically in the treatment of pulmonary hypertension. Here we have alpha blockers. This includes molecules like prazosin and tirazosin, and by blocking the alpha-1 receptor, you're going, to promote, you're going to prevent epinephrine and norepinephrine from promoting vasoconstriction, therefore you're going to promote vasodilation by blocking the effect of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Uh, alpha blockers tend to be used in the control of uh, hypertension. Now we have epoprostenol. Epoprostenol is a prostacyclin uh, uh, analog, so it's basically like the same thing, so it's going to bind the receptor and uh, promote vasodilation uh, by inhibiting MLCK. So this is also used, kind of like placentin, for pulmonary hypertension as well. Um, finally, here we have sildenafil. So one thing we forgot to mention earlier was that cyclic GMP is not only produced by sol soluble guanylocyclase, it's also broken down by an enzyme called uh, phosphodiesterase 5, or PDD5. Now, sildenafil uh, inhibits this enzyme that breaks it down. So by inhibiting the breakdown enzyme, you increase the levels of cyclic GMP. Therefore, sildenafil is going to increase cyclic GMP and promote vasodilation. Uh, therefore, it can help, you know, help uh, vasodilate the artery and help you know, decrease blood pressure. So Benefil is used in the treatment of pulmonary hypertension, and it can also be used in the context of uh, erectile dysfunction. So finally, to summarize some of those pharmacological agents, we have a little table here of the different classes and examples uh, of drugs in those classes. Hope you all enjoyed the videos. Uh, please like and subscribe, and have a good one.